welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. I had a, an experience with God this week, and, and you should say, well, Pastor, you ought to have an experience all the time with God. I do, but this was an unusual experience with God. And um, uh, I think it was Monday night, God woke me up at 3 o'clock in the morning. And, um, and I, I don't do well at 3 o'clock in the morning. Usually I think anything that wakes me up at 3 o'clock in the morning has got to be a demon. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Like, don't bother me, go bother Debbie. You know, and uh, by the way, we need to pray for her. Her uh, retina fell apart tonight, and so she's going in for surgery tomorrow morning. But I'm, I'm believing God. If you'll pray, I'll pray. Let's believe God that God's word will get her healed. And so uh, uh, the next morning I was having coffee. I, Debbie and I were sitting together. And uh, I told her that, you know, God spoke to me for one hour uh, last night. And if, for those of you that want to know what that was like, it really like was not an audible voice. I just knew I was talking to God. And you know what God said to me? I'll, I'll tell you what he said. Believe it or not. I don't care if you believe it or not. I mean, I, you know, you see the gray hair on my head? I don't give a flip what you believe. You know what I'm saying? It's your call. You want to believe it? Fine. You don't want to believe it? Don't believe it. I don't care. Here's the deal. God spoke to me. He said, Deborah preached last weekend the most important and most valuable message this church has ever heard. I went, you woke me up for this? No, I didn't. I didn't say that. I didn't, I didn't say that at all. I, I, I was stunned. You know, I had no more thought of that in a million, million years. I heard the f- message four times from Sunday morning services. And I, I was sharing this with our staff this morning. And... Um, and I heard the message four times, so I really, each time Debbie ministered it, Debbie got new revelation. Each time it was different. By the fourth time, it was, I mean, it just kind of jumped out at the page at me. And so when God woke me up and said that to me, I mean, if I said to you, God woke me up at 3 o'clock in the morning and said, you just preach the best message that's ever preached at the Rock, you'd say, oh, he's just an egotist. Believe me, I wasn't thinking about Debbie preaching a message at 3 o'clock in the morning. This was a God thing. And for one hour, he shared with me something that has changed my life, will change this church. And I want to share that with you, and then I'm going to stop. I'll probably take about 10 minutes and share that with you. Then I'm going to get down on my knees, and we're going to talk about opportunities. Is that all right? Because this is really a time of growth. We do everything in American churches to get people to come to church and be committed to God and love God and follow God and serve God. No matter where you go in the world, all the churches are the same. They all have their singles groups and they all have their koinonia groups and they all have their small groups and Many of them have bus ministries and outreach ministries, all wanting to get people connected with God in a great way. And, and can I say that that's not a bad thing, as God was ministering to me. It wasn't like it was a bad thing, but it was like not the complete thing. And when Deborah went to Genesis 22 on this weekend, And she brought out for the first time the word worship. It's the word worship, if you remember from her teaching. And by the way, I'm so instructed by God to give this to you free, her teaching. If you'll take it and listen to it, I'll give it to you free. We'll make copies. I don't know if we'll have enough copies tonight, but or even if there's anybody back there to make copies, but I'll give them to you absolutely free. She goes to Genesis 22, which we've done a million times in our years as theologians and pastors. And um, she starts to go on this word worship that's found there. It's the first time in the Bible that the word 
worship is used. You remember remember that? First time. And then she explained, explained proper biblical interpretation. In other words, there's a right way to interpret Scripture and a wrong way to interpret Scripture. And it's called the law of first use. When the Bible is using a word for the first time, unless others stated it differently in the Scripture by two or three witnesses, what it said the first time is what it is usually throughout the entire Scripture. And she made this statement. She said, worship is not just the sound of music, clapping of the hands. Worship is not just coming in a worship service and singing a song, even though that's certainly going to be part of it. But she made a statement that worship was a lot more than that as she illustrated, if you'll remember, Abraham taking Isaac to Mount Moriah. And as he was taking, as he was taking his son, his only son according to the scripture, even though he had another one, we know that, but that was the son of the flesh. This was the son of the spirit, Isaac. meant all the world to him. It was the most important thing in his life. He'd waited a hundred years, not like you having a child at 20. He had waited a hundred years for this child to be born. His child's born. God says, I want you to take him up to the mountain and sacrifice him. And remember that he does something. And the Spirit of God is speaking to me in my bed at three, going on four o'clock in the morning, giving me illustrations. And he said the message, listen to this message, the message of sacrificial surrender is what it is all about for the church. Give you an illustration. Flashes to me, just flashes thoughts to me so I can get an impression of what this is like. When I minister at 68 years old, all weekend long, all those services, when Sunday night comes, can I just be frank with you? I don't even want to go to church. The anointing is off of me. I am tired. My back aches. My joints ache. My bones ache. My head is throbbing. Now, while I'm ministering, God, doesn't matter what's wrong with me, God heals me while I'm ministering. When I'm finished ministering, it's like, you're, lo- you're like everybody else. Yeah, bye. And psh, I got to fight the same fight you fight, okay? So let's be honest about this. You know, I'm not any different than you. And I'm anointed to preach this, but I'm not anointed to keep it any more than you are. Are, are you following me? So when he gave me this illustration of me coming in, many times I'll come with dirty old jeans and a dirty old shirt, and I'll sit over there, and I, and I actually don't even want to stand, because here's this music, and it's like 30-year-old music, and I'm 68, you know, and the drums are like, and I'm going, I just hate this. I lean over to Pastor Dan, I hate this music. And, uh, and I'm just a crab, and I just, I'm just really ugly. And you say, well, why did you come? Because I love God. Now, sacrificial worship is when you sacrifice what you want, think, feel like and render to God what he has asked you to do even though you don't feel like it. So real worship that brings Jehovah Jireh, which is the first time we ever heard the word Jehovah Jireh in the Bible, was out of Genesis 22, which is God is your provider. The first time he becomes your provider, first time he became Abraham's provider was in the midst of sacrificial surrender of himself to what God said, even though he didn't feel like it, even though he didn't want it. Man, you know, God spoke to him about his only son to go up and stab him with a knife and burn him up into ashes. <laughs> who went, who goes to God and says, oh, God, thank you. I can hardly wait to do that, man. That is like so cool. I can hardly wait to go up top of the mountain and kill my kid. Now, God doesn't take human sacrifice. It's not our God. So, but Abraham didn't know that at the time. What Abraham knew to do is what God said. Now listen again. Listen. Sacrificial surrender to what is God's says to God 
I really love you more than myself. And therefore, it becomes a first time in the Bible, the word worship. Wow. If I can get you to come to church because you want to really connect with Jehovah Jireh, the provider of everything that you need, through sacrificial, that means giving up yourself, giving away yourself, giving up yourself, surrender to his word and will instead of coming to church because the music's cool, coming to church because your friends are there, coming to church because the seats are comfortable, coming to church because you just, you know, uh, have nothing else to do, but you come to church because you are making a sacrificial surrender of your heart and your life, which turns out to be worship that activates Jehovah Jireh on your part. This church has now done what it's supposed to do, and you can take all the groups and throw them out. Because now our attendance, and now our life, and now everything we do is done, not because we want to do it or feel like doing it, but because in fact, we don't want to do it and don't feel like doing it, but we're going to do it anyway because God wants it. Now watch this. Let's take that for a moment and apply the same principle. I love my wife because I'm called by God to love my wife. I don't love my wife because she deserves it. Even though she does, but let's say she's a brat. And I want to just punch her lights out. And so I love my wife because, why? Uh, God tells me to. So I sacrifice and surrender my feelings of, ugh, she doesn't deserve it, to loving her because God said it, not because of what her action is. The marriage absolutely explodes. Now, she reverences me. Nowhere does it say a woman loves her husband. It, he, a woman reverences her husband. Us men don't dig love. We dig reverence. You respect me. Woman. <laughs> and, and, and that's called reverence. And God knows that. That's why God said, women, you are to reverence your husband. So when she reverences me, even though I don't deserve it, but I do it sacrificially because God said it, man, I've got a healthy marriage on its way. Are you, are you following me? And, and, and it's exactly the same thing with anything. And what we do oftentimes in life is we do stuff that we think is the right stuff or that feels good or that we want to do or we see something instead of what God wants us to do. So if I can get this church to understand that your relationship with God. Now listen, it's a sacrifice of praise, but it's also, if you will, those that worship in spirit, God was sharing to me, and what? Truth. Yeah. And truth is not what I feel. Yeah. Truth is what he says. Yeah. So if God designs a healthy place for me to go to church, there I get gassed up. There I get energized. There I get redirected. There I get washed from the roadkill of the week. And I say, I don't feel like it, and I don't go. I haven't worshiped God. But if I say, man, I haven't eaten dinner. I'm starving. I I'm, I'm late. I'm going to go anyway. I don't know how I'm going to get there. I don't even know how I'm going to get the gas to get home. But I'm going. Guess what? That's called sacrificial Worship, and if you run out of gas on the way home, let me say, say something else. That's even a greater sacrificial worship to the king of glory. And so this message of last weekend becomes the heartbeat of the future of this church. That we're not trying to be cool. Remember, we're, we're always got smoke and lights and cool things and cool sounds and cool looks and you know everybody comes because we're the greatest show in town instead of the sacrificial surrender to the word of the Lord 
Now, he comes along, he's sharing this with me. He says, two steps to that. One, you've got to learn the word, and then you've got to apply the word. The applying is where you get out of the way to apply the word. Now, watch this. In James, it says that you hear and do, and not just to be a hearer only. So you can come into a place like this and hear what to do, but never do it. It's in the sacrificial rendering of giving of yourself for the betterment of someone else, which, by the way, is our description of love. So you're saying to God, I love you. I'm giving of myself for you. And when you do that, you're saying, God, I love you. And you're saying, God, I really worship you. I remember one time as a young man in my late 20s, um, I hadn't been saved very long, was in church, and God said to me, will you raise your hands to me and be an example to the other men? I said, God, wait a minute. I'm an ex-professional athlete. I'm 6'5", and in those days, 220 pounds. And, and, and uh, you want me to, okay, I'll do whatever you want me to do. God, I'll do it. <laughs> and I'll never forget him saying, I, I said, raise your hands. I am. And it really took something of surrendering sacrificially myself to do this. Because I felt like a jerk doing it. And then, with all the audacity in the world, because whatever, it's God, will you dance for me? <sighs> I'll do it at home. <laughs> and I'm not telling you to go dance in other aisles of our church because the ushers will throw you out. But, uh, but nevertheless, uh, you know, so I had to learn how to, to do what I do sacrificially. And that opened up the door to God meeting my needs, Jehovah Jireh. Now, I said all of that because I love you enough to tell you that most people in American churches and any church in the world does not want to teach you that because most people don't want to hear that. They want to play games, they want to feel good, they want to laugh, and they want their ears tickled. But if we're going to be a real church, we have to learn what it's like to be a real follower of Christ. He says, pick up your cross and follow me, he says. And can I tell you something? With 10, that, and then eventually 12, that fell back to 11, followers of Christ change the world because Peter writes have we not given up everything for you again sacrificial surrender <clears throat> there are like 3,000 4,000 people that attend our church that haven't given anything we're asking you to make a sacrifice could you put this up a sacrificial surrender that's all. We're saying if you'll give a buck a day, one dollar every single day for the next three years, we'll have enough money to pay this church off and you will stand before God someday and say, I have done some, a stinking buck a day. Out of that, only out of the 7,000 people that give to this church, only 1,400 said, yes, we'll do it. There ought to be more of you. And there's some of you in here, you know you can do more than a dollar a day. But very minimum, you can't do a dollar a day. How about a quarter a day? So you could say someday that you gave something. Give something. Make some kind of pledge. And later on today, we'll hand that out to you. And then right on there, a dollar a day, and just throw it in there. They'll send you a letter to confirm what the amount is, and we'll go from there. Simple as that. Sacrificial surrender. I'm telling you, without it, it's rubbing you the wrong way, but without it, it's hard to worship God deeply. You can worship God superficially, but deeply, until you get out of the way and let God do something. So it starts with things like this. Amen. It's so simple. And I'm not asking much. I'm asking you to help us get free and clear 
at this building so we can take 87,000 a month and pump it back into winning souls and changing lives in America. Man, that's a good, that's a good thing. So for one hour, God ministered that to me. I thought I'd share it with you. I will give you free as long as they last. If we don't have them today, we'll have a bunch made up for this week. And when you come to church, you pick one up. Get a hold of Debbie's CD and listen to it over and over again until it drops in your heart. Because that's what this is all about. Sacrificial surrender to the word and ways of God. Is anybody okay with that? All right, let's go. Stand to your feet. Let's go before the Lord. I've got 15 minutes, and I can do this in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Father, we love you so much. We come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for allowing the word of God to explode on the inside of us in such a way that we know without a shadow of a doubt we haven't come into the house of God to hear from a man or a woman or a tall man or a short man, a young man, old man, Black man, white man, brown man. We have come to hear from any of that. We have come to hear from the teacher of the church, the Holy Spirit. So welcome, Holy Spirit. Here's our heart. Just like before, fill us with your way, your word, your will, so that we might sacrificially surrender all of us to you. And we'll give you the praise and glory as Jehovah Jireh rises big and provides all of our needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We'll give you the praise, give you the glory, give you the honor. We thank you, Lord, that we are a peculiar, that means different people, called by your name. And we thank you, Father, we do not live life like everybody else on the planet. We live life different. Now, Lord, we need your word. Cause it to become alive. Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say amen. amen. We've been talking about a wonderful subject called opportunity. A lot of times people don't realize that opportunity is not just something that happens every now and then, but when there's godly opportunity, there's an endless flow of his opportunity. And that's really the title of part number two, is the endless flow of opportunities. So many of us would love to have an opportunity to do something and accomplish something. We want to be in the right place at the right time like we talked about last week. If we could just be in the right place at the right time. But can I just say something? When you are born of the Spirit of God, opportunities come your way on a constant basis. They're continuous and they will overflow you with great opportunities. Whether you take the opportunities or not is really your call. Remember last time we were together, we talked about if you do nothing, you get nothing. A lot of people want something for nothing. It doesn't work that way. I mean, you can try to get a garden, but you'll never have a garden unless you plant something. So a lot of times, remember, what you sow, you reap. Everything produces after its own kind. Those are the laws of the scripture. So therefore, you and I are going to have to come along and live our life according to the word of God, the ways of God, and what we sow, we reap. You don't reap anything because oftentimes we don't sow anything. Or a lot of times we're not reaping because we miss opportunities. And that's very important for us to understand about opportunities. Godly opportunities are different than worldly opportunities. Can I just make a statement to you? Um, a lot of times there's worldly opportunities that lead you down the wrong path. You don't want to go there. You don't want worldly opportunities that will take you away from the things of God. You want the opportunities that God opens doors that no man can open. God closes doors no man can close. The Bible also makes a statement that the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. In other words, God knows how to get you into that right place at the right time in order for those opportunities to take place. The opportunities may be there, but it doesn't mean you're going to be strong enough or desire them enough or want to do what's necessary to take advantage of that opportunity. How many opportunities have we missed in our lives? We didn't feel like we were ready. It didn't feel like we were prepared didn't think we could handle opportunities. We found out something last time when we were together, you remember this, that all opportunities, number one, will be resisted. Because godly opportunities, the devil doesn't want you involved in it. 
and there's a resistance there that's going to try to stop. But always keep this in mind, that just because there's resistance, because there's tough times, because there's situations that you must go through in order to get the opportunity in your life operating, doesn't mean it's not God. And so you're going to find yourself from time to time, there's a open doors that are given to you, but you'll be resisted if you stop because of the open doors or because you feel the resistance and don't go through the open doors, you'll find yourself in a place of missing godly opportunities. We also found out that God wants you to be ready. Remember the ten virgins, one, uh, five virgins with oil, five without oil, they run out, try to get oil, and literally missed the bridegroom as an example when they came, because why? They were not ready. Your commitment, now I'm going to say this to you, how to stay ready is your commitment to the things of God. If you've got a little commitment, you won't be ready all the time. But if you have a deep, passionate commitment to the things and the ways of God that goes beyond yourself, my goodness sakes of life, now you know that you're always going to be a person that is going to be ready and how ready we are is based on how much we are committed to the things of God. Oftentimes people say, I'm really committed, I'm really committed. They're really not committed. They're committed as long as it's convenient. Come on. Let me say it again. We Christians in America are committed as long as it's convenient. Instead of committed no matter what, even if it's not convenient, even if it's tough, even if it rubs against me, if it scratches against my flesh, if you might, that we find ourselves giving up, stopping, and backing off. We also found something else. We found that God's going to always place in front of you a place of service. And how you operate and how you respond to the service is going to mean a lot because whether you're going to be selfish or not selfish has to do with it. Let me just make this statement to you. If God gives you opportunities and wants to give you great open doors of opportunities, he would not be very wise, and God is very wise, but he would not be very wise to give you opportunities to do something that you can't handle. So therefore, what he does is he builds you in opportunities, builds you in your faith towards opportunities. He oftentimes starts very small. In other words, if you can't be faithful in the small things, how can he trust you with the great godly things? And you find yourself in a place of not wanting to do them because they're meaningless or they're too small. But if you'll be faithful to those little opportunities, and by the way, oftentimes those little opportunities are just spiritual things to see whether or not you're going to go yourself to the next level where God's going to bring opportunities. God may bring somebody across your path to witness to them. He gives you an opportunity to, as an open door. You either do it or don't do it. Or invite someone to church. You either do it or don't do it. These are all little areas of service. And those service areas are going to be determined on whether or not you are selfish or selfless. Because if you're selfish, you say, no, I'm not going to do it. It doesn't feel good. I don't want to do it. And it's a little teeny opportunity. Really meant nothing to you, but it meant something to God. And it meant something to somebody else. And needed you to do that, but you missed the opportunity. Therefore, can I just say this to you? If you constantly keep missing the little opportunities, do you think for a moment God's going to give you big opportunities? Let me say it again. If you constantly keep missing the little opportunities, and little opportunities are not always about you, where you receive the benefit of it. Little opportunities are just proving that you can handle the big opportunities. Are you following me? And if you're constantly missing the little opportunities, little opportunities like an open door to witness, an open door to say something about Jesus, uh, an open door to bring someone to church or to tell them about Jesus or lead to someone in the Lord, or just to stop where you're at in your physical life and pray for somebody even though it's a public thing and it might be a bit embarrassing, but man, you just set a seed. And therefore, there's this little opportunity. If you keep missing little opportunities, now what we're doing is expecting God to give us big opportunities. You know, we want the big opportunities in life that will open up the big doors when we haven't even handled the small doors. It just doesn't work that way, my friends. So what happens in your Christian development for all of us is whether or not you will be faithful. Just like I was sharing with you earlier, man, I had to find out, God had to find out for me as a young man whether or not I will do what he wants me to do even though I felt silly. Finally to the place where I got past myself and got to the place where I will do what God asked me to do. 
then the small service that I was doing for him now then proved that I could handle the small things so that God can open doors for greater opportunities later on. Many of us, let me say this to you again, many of us want the big opportunities that are obvious blessings without getting the little opportunities that are no blessings. But when you are a master at the little opportunities with no blessings, but you do it just because you love God, isn't that sacrificial surrender? Yeah. Sacrificial surrender says, God, I love you so much. And then God opens up great doors to you. So for all of us in here, for an example, let me just say something else about the character of us. Sometimes we think God in so many different ways, like God, I want the big when I haven't done the little. That We'll talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. Have you ever thought about this, that a lot of times people have said, uh, your loss is my gain. Have you ever had anybody say that to you? Your loss is our, your, our loss is your gain. Can I just say something about that to you? Can I say this? God loves the person who lost. Don't think for a moment God's going to take somebody's loss and make it a blessing to you. God loves those people that have lost as much as you who need the gain. And God can bring you a blessing, opportunity, without taking from someone else's lost life. In fact, if you Proverbs, I don't know if you got this up or not. Uh, in Proverbs 24, verse number 17, just pop it up. It says this, do not rejoice when your enemy falls. And there's this tendency to say, man, they're lost. Ha ha, my gain. They failed, and now I can pick up the difference and make a bunch on it. What a great opportunity. Can I tell you something? I'm not saying it, don't do it. I'm saying be very cautious. Do you understand the difference between don't do it and be very cautious? That doesn't mean it won't work sometimes, because sometimes those opportunities are there with institutions and not human beings. And then you can take advantage of the institution because it's a business and it's in a loss, uh, uh, profit loss mode. But when it comes to an individual, be very cautious. I remember one time coming to a guy, and just leave the verse up there just for a moment. And I was just a young man in my mid-20s. I lived in Santa Barbara. I had a radio show, and I was preaching the gospel on the radio and I would play music, and I would then break and talk about subjects and have guest speakers. And I did this on Sundays in Santa Barbara, California. I did it on a, a radio station called K-Tide. K-Tide had two radio stations that I knew of. It was an FM station and an AM station with simulcast in Santa Barbara, California. And this is, you know, this is 40-some-odd years ago, guys. And so... Uh, when I was on the radio, I was on the AM side and the FM side. God speaks to me, says, go to the owner and tell him that he is to give you the AM side for Christian radio. And I said, I mean, in those days, a radio station in, was in Santa Barbara, an AM station probably worth three, four, five hundred thousand. Today, you can translate that to 25 million. That'd be like somebody going today to a radio station and say, how much do you want? They'll say 25 million. That's how much a radio say. That's what it's translated was in those days. So I go sit with the owner, heavy set guy, sitting behind his desk, a few years older than me. I sat down, I said, you know who I am? He says, yeah. He says, uh, uh, how's your show doing? I said, it's doing great. Love preaching the gospel, you know, uh, talking to people about Jesus. I said, God spoke to me about you. And he looks up from behind his desk, and the sweat starts to run off of his forehead. I'll never forget this. His face went from white to red. I thought, God, he's either going to come over the desk and beat me up, or he's going to freak out or something. And he says, well, what did he say? He said to tell you that if you will give us the AM part of this radio station for Christian radio, he will bless the FM station you have and all the other things that you have your hand on. <coughs> and he looks at me and he says, he said that to you? Sweat starts to run down his face. And he says, okay, I'll do it. I didn't know the guy had seven other radio stations in the United States. Had no idea. 
So when he gave us the AM station, which, by the way, was translated and changed around, and now if you go to Santa Barbara, there's an FM station. It all started with the AM station, and God blessed his other seven stations. Now watch this, because God doesn't take from people without blessing them. And sometimes we want to take from people. And we use the scripture, the, the, the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. I'm going to tell you something. You better get off of that verse because that is not the heartbeat of God and you're not the judge of that. And God will do it his way. But listen to these words. He says, and do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles. In other words, God wanted to make sure that if this man gave up his AM station, he would be blessed in all of his other stations. He became so prosperous it was unbelievable. So a lot of times we want the opportunities and we don't care who's in the line of getting them and you ought to care who's in the line because God's not going to crush somebody else for you to be successful because he loves them. Come on, somebody. Now... I want to ask you a question. Here's a cool question. Who gets godly opportunities? Here's the funniest answer of the whole thing. Are you ready? Everybody. Saved and unsaved. You say, well, why would the, why would the unsaved get saved? Why would they have godly opportunities? Because God loves them. First opportunity they get is to have God. That's the biggest and best opportunity of all. That's the opportunity you and I have. We have an opportunity to get all the word, use it in our marriage, use it in the job, use it in our finances, use it in our dream, use it in our vision, use it with our children. We have an opportunity to take the word of God. Here's this great, amazing opportunity to change your entire life and the existence of your life and the children that come after you. There's an opportunity there for you and I. And many times people don't take it even though they call themselves Christians. They come in and hear the word, they quote the word, but they don't do the word. And until we have sacrificial surrender to the word of God, there'll never be the worship that we need to have. Is anybody listening to what I'm saying? So I say everybody who gets godly opportunities, every one of us, all the time, every day, I'll prove it to you. Jesus used as an illustration. We were there last time we were together in Matthew 25. You know where it is. Matthew 25, let's take a look at verse number 14 of Matthew 25. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling in a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. So here he is, calling his own servants and delivering his goods to these guys. Who are they? They are his who? Servants. The illustration here is about you and about me. And it's about opportunities and what we do with them. You've heard me teach on this before, but I'm going to do it again because there's all kinds of neat things for you and I to see in here that we haven't seen before. So he comes and uses this illustration. He says this, for the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling. Jesus is like, I'm going to go away for a while and I'm going to leave you with the power of the kingdom of God. What are you going to do with what God gives you? God says tremendous things. He wants to give you great, mighty, marvelous, wonderful things. Says, no, what are you going to do with it? These opportunities you have, listen to this. How about an opportunity to break out of poverty? How about an opportunity to have a great, loving marriage? How about an opportunity to raise kids that aren't, brats in society and weirdos and freaks how about a great opportunity to have a fabulous loving caring strong healthy family for the future i mean is that not worth something so we all have that opportunity so here god comes along and he gives he, he he's gonna he distributes this opportunity among his people that's what he's done with you and i verse number 15 comes along says these words watch this and to one he gave five talents, to another he gave two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on his journey. Now listen to this. He gives to every single buddy, somebody something. There is not one of you that don't have an opportunity for something. It may be small, it may be medium, it may be large. But you're going to have to do something with what God gives you before God gives you more. Yeah. Are you following? We're going to see that in just a moment. 
Because opportunity is a funny little thing. Sometimes we don't take opportunities because they're too small. Did you know when you have an opportunity to get the Word of God, to get the Word of God, to learn the Word of God, to do the Word of God so that it could change your future, all of it started with something small. The Bible says don't despise the big, small beginnings. Right. And so therefore, every one of us have opportunity in something. But notice this, he gave each one. He didn't leave one out and say, listen, I'm giving you five, giving you two, giving you one, and there's one or two of you are going to get nothing. Some of you feel like you have no opportunities in life, but they're there. They're just so little right now because you haven't developed them and followed through with them in order to get to the big ones. I'll prove it to you by looking at this parable. And he comes along and he immediately goes on his journey. But everybody, listen, everybody say everybody. everybody. Could everybody say everybody? everybody? Nah, you're staring at me. Could everybody say everybody? everybody. Now I want you to say everybody and that's me and point to yourself. It's true. Everybody has something. Maybe small, maybe medium, maybe large. But you have something from God. Now what you do with it determines what happens to you in the future. Are you following me? Now notice what it says. Verse number 16 comes along. Verse 16 makes it very clear. He says, and then, the, then he who had received five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. You know, the way this verse is set up is means this guy got it. He knew exactly what to do with it. Wait a minute. The way the verse reads is immediately after he gave the talents away and went on his journey, the Bible says he immediately went on his journey. And then he says this. He said, the one that received the five went out and did something. He didn't look at him, didn't hold on to him, didn't do anything. He knew exactly what to do. I mean, he was like trained. That tells me he has done this before. Are you following me? And he immediately received the five talents and, he said, and went out and traded with them and made another five talents. Now, verse number 17 comes along. Let's take a look at verse 17. Verse 17 says these words, and likewise. I love the word likewise because here's the guy that got the two talents is doing exactly what the guy he saw do with the five talents. And likewise, he goes out and does the same thing. He was out and received two talents, made two more. Most likely, he started with. Can I ask you a question? Do you think the guy that got the five just went out and made five, or do you think he knew how to make the five? Do you think he might have started somewhere in his life with one and developed a five? Probably. Do you think the guy that had the two had the two because he started with one and made the two, and now he could be trusted with two to make the four? Probably. A lot of times we don't understand that. See, uh, a lot of times we see ourselves as the product of the one and we don't do anything with it. It seems so simple. It seems so small. It seems so insignificant. It's so, it's so unimportant. Why, 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 why do I want to do anything with it? Who cares? Nobody cares. God won't even care. But God's watching to see what you do with it to see whether or not you're going to get two next time around. He comes along and he says these words, verse number 18. Listen to this. But, I love the word but there. The word but means, oh, here comes a transition in thinking. The two first guys did pretty good. The second, third guy, uh-oh, but. Verse 18, but he who had received one went and dug a hole in the ground and hid it from his Lord's money. And after a long time, verse number 19, the Lord of the servants came and settled the accounts with them. And he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents and said, Lord, you delivered unto me five talents, look. I have gained five more talents besides them. Everybody has an opportunity. What you do with the opportunity determines what you're going to do in the future. Now, let me say it again. Everybody has an opportunity. What you do with the opportunity determines what you do in the future. One more time. Everybody has an opportunity. What you do with the opportunity has to do with your future. Most people say, well, it's either not big enough, it's not important enough, or it's, I don't see it, it's not big, any big deal, nobody really cares. Uh, it's so, but the guy got two said, man, no, the guy got two didn't complain about the guy that had five. He just went out and did what the guy that had five did. That's why the word, well, I, why it's there. He said, who received five talents came and brought his five talents and said, Lord, he said, I've gained five more. Verse number 21. 
Verse number 21, and the Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things, and I have made you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Can I ask you a question? How did he become a ruler over many things? Because he was a faithful person over the few. That tells you right there that he started off in a small way. We're always wanting to start off at the top instead of working our way through the small. I want to make a lot of money real fast and have an opportunity. And God says, listen, it's a small beginning. Go out and make a little on this. Be faithful on that and watch God open the door and it'll be more and more and more. Let me tell you something about business. Did you know that 95% of every business in America was started with so small that the owner will tell you admittedly never dreamt that business would ever be successful? It was so small, they were just trying to make a living for their family. And all of a sudden, it became enormous. Here's how. Because they started small and worked their way up. If they, and we Christians want to start at the top. We don't have nothing, but oh, God, give it to me. Oh, yeah, but why don't you go to work to get it? That's how he gives it to you. I, I have an opportunity to bring a dollar a day, but I don't have a dollar, so I won't do anything for the church and, and freedom of the future, which is my economic recovery plan that God's given in my life, and I won't do anything. All you have to do is get off your butt and go collect cans. You can collect a dollar a day with a. Did you know if you collect 20 cans, you get a buck? You got to be kidding, or something like that. 20 or 25 cans, you, you get a buck? You gotta be kidding me. You drink that much in soda? If you don't, you know other people who do. <laughs> and you start somewhere. And then he comes along in verse number 22. And he says this He has also received two talents, came to him and said, Lord, you delivered on me two talents. Look! And he's proud of it. I have gained two more talents. Now he said, You know, it's not very much, not as big as the other guy. He didn't say any of that. He was proud. When you take nothing, make something out of it. Or you take a little, make something out of it. Before God, that's a big deal. It's every bit as big as the five guy, the two guys, every bit as big before God. Because you know why I know that? Look at what God says to the next guy. Next verse. And God says to him, and his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Did you know that's exactly the same reward as the guy that had the big stuff? So we're afraid of the little stuff and being faithful with the little stuff, yet the same exact reward for the guy that had the five comes to the guy that had the two. And they both started with little, few, and did something with it that, began, listen to this, listen, invested something, put their time in, believed God to do it, gave up their self, and all of a sudden now they've got more. And the, not only did he get more, he says, enter into the joy. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool in itself. I mean, having it is one thing, enjoying it's another. Whew, when you know it comes from God. It's really special. First number 24 comes along and makes this statement. Then he who had received one talent came and said to the Lord, I know that you are a hard man. Let me tell you something. The way we perceive God sometimes is amazing. We, are, we, we think we know who God is. And he comes along and he makes a statement. He says, I, I, I know you're hard. So? So? Even if the statement's true. So? Is he not loving? Is he not caring? Is he not merciful? He's not some flippant little thing that's full pliable that, you know, is here today and gone to Maui tomorrow. You better believe God's hard. And because God's hard, he can keep his promises or not keep his promises. He says these words, I know you're hard. And he comes along and he says this, and you reap where you have not sown and gather where you have not scattered seed. Now, when I first read that as a young man, that kind of ticked me off. I said, what is this guy talking about God like that for? Reaping where he's not sown and gathering where he's not scattered seed. 
That's kind of a rude thing to say to God. Then the next verse comes along and it says these words. Watch this. And, and I was afraid and I went and I hid your talents in the ground and look, there you have what is yours. In other words, I just give it back to you. I mean, that's, is that so bad? It is when you have a God who can reap where he has not sown and harvests where he hasn't scattered seed. In other words, he can make something out of nothing whenever he wants. What have you got to lose? And what are you afraid of? Are you following me? And he makes this statement. In the next statement, verse 26, just shook me up so much. He says, but the Lord answered him and said, you wicked and lazy servant. You know that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered. I'm a God can do anything. You know I take nothing and make something out of it. I open the blind eyes. I walk on water. I move the planets around. I hold the moon in its right axis. I hold the sun in its right. And you're worried about your one talent that I gave you? Even if you lost it and screwed it up, could I not give it back to you? What's God mad at? God's angry about the fact, listen to this, that this guy did nothing with what God gave him. Not because he was afraid of losing what he had. God doesn't lose what he has. You might lose it, but God finds it. Verse number 27. So you ought to have deposited money with the bankers, and, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. And then verse number 28, listen to this. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. Wait a minute. Take it from the poor guy and give it to the rich guy? That isn't the way we do things in America. In America, we take from the rich guy and give it to the poor guy. Isn't it funny how God's economy is different than the American economy? The American economy is on welfare and entitlements, and I'm not against them, for a while, but not for life. We need to help everybody get going. But then, then everybody needs to, when you get going, this is about the God on the inside of you, not about the gods on the outside that keep you down. It's about the God on the inside that lifts you up. And he says, take the talent from it, take the one up from it, and give it to the guy who has 10. Why would you give it to the guy who has 10? Because he knows how to do something with something. When you have something, you don't give it to people who don't do anything with it. You know, you got a stockbroker and a guy doesn't do a thing for you. You're going to give him more money? Say, thank you so much for doing nothing for me. Just give me what you have, you stupid stockbroker, and I'm going to put it with somebody who's a smart stockbroker. <laughs> Verse number 29 comes along and says this. For everyone who has, in other words, takes the opportunities in life, even though they're small, listen to this, will be given. And he will have, and he will have, what? He will have what? He will have what? In other words, everybody that has, they have because they take the opportunity to do something, even though it's small, and work their way up. They probably had one, and he worked to two, and he worked the two to four, and he worked the four to ten, eight, and so on. And now here's this guy coming along. That's the guy I can trust with. So everybody that has will have more, and he will have Jesus said, I've come to give you life and give it more abundantly. abundantly. How does that happen? Is it abundant because you just sit back and someone gives you something? Or is it abundant because you believe God, the God on the inside of you, yeah, it's going to be tough. Yeah, you're going to be in a fight. Yeah, you're going to be afraid. Yes, opportunity will be resisted. 
Yes, you're going to find yourself in a place where you're going to have to realize that you weren't given the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. But guess what? He says we'll be taken away and have abundance. But from him who does not have, that's the guy that had one, even what he has. In other words, I gave the opportunity to him. He did nothing with it. I'm going to take that opportunity to give it to this guy. And that's why you see some people in the body of Christ prospering and other people not. Some people are saying, give me something. Some people are saying, I have it to give you. I'll give it to you. I don't know about you, but I want to be the giver, not the receiver. Now, the, the last part of this verse says something interesting that we may never have seen before, but let's see if we can see it again. Verse number 30. And cast the unprofitable servant in the outer darkness. There will be weeping and ashes. Now, wait a minute. What kind of a God gives a guy one talent, he screws it up, and throws him into outer darkness? A God who has given him time and time and opportunity and opportunity. This is, you have a picture that he did it one time and got thrown into outer darkness. No, no. God's a God of mercy. Therefore, he had to have given him many times until he was finally over with giving it to him and he wouldn't let him prosper at all. He wouldn't allow him to prosper at all. And he throws him in outer darkness because he had given him many opportunities and he said no to all of them. How many people attend church that say, I've got no opportunities, but they've got many opportunities. And guess what? They didn't make it. Verse number 30. Let me show you something. Last verse, and I quit. Proverbs 124. In fact, I'm lying. I'm going to give you two verses. Proverbs, because I have called you, and you refused. I have stretched out my hand, and no one regarded it. And he goes on in Proverbs 1, 24, as saying, you're a cursed people. Matthew, the 10th chapter, verse 14 and 15, first missionary journey, Jesus is telling these guys, don't take anything with you, go find out who's worthy. And he says, and whoever will not, verse number 14 says, and whoever will not receive you, nor hear your words, they're not worthy. They're getting opportunity, and they're not going to do anything with it. When you depart from the house or the city, shake the dust off your feet. Assuredly, I say unto you, why? Because they wouldn't take the opportunity. Watch this. It will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment and in that city. Why? Because they had opportunity and they wouldn't take it. Opportunity for all of us is, comes in a package. It's very small when it starts but it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to witness, and we just do it. It's an opportunity to go to church, and we don't feel like it, but we do it anyway. It's an opportunity to bring a tithe or an offering on a regular basis, but we don't do it. And we wonder why we're in trouble. Most of you tonight, you've got to hear this. God has given you an opportunity, a simple and wonderful opportunity to hear the word of God and be a doer. God opens doors. He doesn't open doors because you're pretty or smart. doesn't open doors because you're a size four. He doesn't open doors because you're a D cup. He doesn't open doors because you got a lot of makeup on. He doesn't open doors because you've got degrees and, 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 and uh, 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 a bunch of numbers after your name and initials after your name. He doesn't open the doors because you went through school. He opens doors because he's God Almighty. And the ones that don't want to take advantage never get anything. And the ones that do take advantage get everything. Can I just say this to you? I love you so much to tell you like it is. A lot of times, when you know, we, we have traditional churches that won't even read from the Bible to you. You know why? Because they really don't believe you can handle it. So they make a bunch of traditional rituals out of their services. 
Because you really are too stupid to believe the Bible. This place believes in you. We believe you need to know the truth and that all things are possible to him that believes. Not because you're cool or educated or smart, talented or gifted, just because you're a believer. When an opportunity comes and it's little, make sure you follow up. Even if the results stink, God saw it. And he says, when, when you're, listen, and when you are faithful over the little, I'll make you Lord over the bunch. And that's what he's talking about. Opportunities. Come on, if the Lord spoke to you tonight, give him a great big praise. <laughs> I have one minute to get somebody saved. Some of you that are in here are going to die and go to hell. You don't have to. I want to personally pray with you tonight. I want you to check with the person next to you. Say, come on, I'll go with you. I'm going to dismiss the people. They're all going to walk out that way. You that need prayer for salvation tonight, give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. I'm going to pray with you right here. Don't go out that way. Get your stuff. Come down the aisles this way and meet me right here in front. Do you hear me? Every single one of you, you're having an opportunity now. Opportunity. Opportunity to give God all of your heart, give God all of your life, be born again, headed for heaven, and denying your presence in hell. You're going to have to do this. So don't walk out that way. Get your friends, get your stuff, meet me right here, and I'll personally pray with you after church service to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Everybody stand. I'm going to dismiss the rest of you. Raise your hands. Father, these are your people called by your name. We thank you that the word of God becomes alive all the time, more and more, on the inside of us, and we give you the praise and glory for it. I'm asking you to bless these people. Give them great opportunity. Start somewhere, God. I know you will. And watch them fulfill that you have asked them to do. And God, we know that they will end up a blessed people. So Father, we're in agreement about the Inland Empire with a great big shout. We say that the Inland Empire shall be saved. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow, you repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.